and I know one of the reasons you're checking in is because of Dr. Kathy Pratt. And I agree with you. I think she's extraordinary. And you can read all her credits, but I'd like to add the credit. Of the it isn't just all that she knows professionally. It is the heart with which she approaches and uses what she knows. Kathy, dear, are you here? I am here and I, I think you're extraordinary and the best mother that I know. And with that, let's plunge right in and talk about this first tip, this very important tip. So before we start, um, um, I'm always honored to be in the presence of Eustacia who, who um, learned about autism and parented Temple without the benefit of any textbooks or conferences before we really understood what autism was and she's been a real pioneer. And um, Eustacia and I have actually had a couple conversations as we go through these tips. So it's going to be, um, I'm going to be giving some tips and then Eustacia is going to be giving some insight based on her um, experiences with Temple and beyond. So the first tip that I want to give is that um, it would be lovely if there was a recipe or cookbook that said child has an autism spectrum disorder, does this behavior, do this, and the behavior will go away. You have to understand that behavior is not simply inside the individual. Behavior is influenced by context, by skills individuals have learned, by relationships. And I think the most important thing is, is that behavior is a dance, and we're part of that dance. And so how we engage in that dance will also create and, and facilitate and, and influence the kind of behavior that we see with the child. So I can tell you as an educational consultant, one of the things that I'm not good at is having somebody call me saying, I have a child who has this diagnosis, does this, what do we do? Because there's always more going on. And we're going to talk about that process a little bit. Eustacia, your thoughts on this? Well, uh, Kathy, your, your uh, audio for me, isn't coming through clearly. So yes, could you? Uh, it may be the, the adjusting the mic a little bit, but uh, from from what I'm reading here, uh, two thoughts come to my mind. Uh, first of all, as I've said before, um, there are no answers. There are only choices, and choices can be changed, and you will change them and you will be changed by them. Because at the, the most basic level, the problem with autism is it isn't just with our children, it's with us. It, 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 as I've said before too, um, autism is two-way traffic on a one-way street. We don't know what they're, where they're going, they don't know where we're going, and there's no traffic light, no cop, and no way to know how to proceed. It's dark. We're going to have to just do the best we can, step by step. And this is what I mean about, about choices. You, you will make a choice and make a move, and if it doesn't work, don't worry, make another choice. It's a two-way street. Okay, and we'll we'll let Kathy try this one talking. Where is tip two? Advance twice. Advance again. Oh, yeah, I think that that's going to go to tip three. I don't know why tip two isn't there. I have tip two. Do you want me to read it? No, I've got it, Eustacia. So, I'll just go and I'll get it here. So, Kathy, if the sound doesn't work, we will have you take your headset off and try it without your headset. Okay. So, tip two, Eustacia, can you hear me a little bit better now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, so tip two is to recognize that punishment is only a short-term solution to problem behavior. It does not necessarily equate a long-term behavior change. Typical disciplinary approaches are often ineffective with those on the spectrum. And what I find is in working in schools and working with families, oftentimes folks want to kind of think about what were traditional disciplinary practices that we've used with other children. 
And many times those will not work with their children. So let me give you an example of that. Um, there are children with autism on the autism spectrum, and I'm sure other children as well, that when you become upset and you raise your voice and you scream at the child, it actually may excite them and it may actually serve as a means of providing them with attention. The other thing is, is that, and we'll talk about this, is that at the heart of it, for many of these kids, behavior is really a skill deficit. And so telling them no or telling them not to do something does not, does not really solve the issue. So we're going to talk about long-term behavior change. And the short term, you may be able to adjust behavior or with certain people. But if you're going to look at long term behavior change, realize that typical disciplinary approaches are oftentimes going to be ineffective with folks on the spectrum. Extension. Uh, my only contribution to this is uh, Temple. When she was young, uh, what worked the best with her was consistency, a combination of consistency and expectation. The days were the same so that she could recognize the pattern and it would repeat. And uh, we were able to achieve this. Her teacher, Mrs. Deach, and I would talk regularly. So Temple found that what happened at home, Mrs. Deach seemed to know it. And what happened at school, I seemed to know it. Now, what this did was to create in her an expectation. She began, she put the whole picture together and she saw what was expected of her and knew that the pattern would repeat exactly. And this was a big help for her. And, and, Yes, it, it sounds as though I was just wandering in a wilderness when I raised Temple. But actually, you see, there were these wonderful women who did know, who did understand, and who not only guided Temple, but guided me. It was valuable. Um, Kathy, I'm going to ask you to take your headset off and try it without your headset. Can we do that? Okay, is that better? That's much better. Yes, unplug it too. I think it's you're getting double stuff on there, so. I'm okay. hearing an echo in there. Can you hear me now? Let me go forward with this. So tip three is that what we want from a behavioral perspective as an uh, ABA person or certified behavior analyst, the only definition of consequence is that it follows a behavior. And the only definition of reinforcement is that it increases a behavior, it can increase a positive behavior or a negative behavior. The only definition of punishment is that it is going to decrease a behavior. So what you really want to look at is when children engage in behavior, we have to ask, what is the payoff? So for example, for children who engage in self-injurious behavior, if you line many of them up, oftentimes there is actually sensory feedback that those children are receiving from it. It's fulfilling some need. And the other analogy that I look at is, is that in schools, um, oftentimes people will look at suspension or expulsion as an approach to behavior. But for some of our kids, what, what happens is, is that these kids would prefer to actually be home. So suspension and expulsion is actually um, a reinforcer for them and not a punisher. They're in a school setting, they feel failure, they have a behavior, and then they get to go home. And they can play video games at home. And so if they continue to do behaviors that get them sent home, then you should know that actually being sent home is a reinforcer. So when children continually engage in a behavior, you have to question is, is our response actually a reinforcer and not a punishment? What is maintaining the behavior? And you, Stacia. Well, it's true what I, what's written here that it, it, this is true, uh, Kathy, of all children raising them. Uh, you have to help the all children to grow into a social pattern that makes life work. And one of the big advantages for me with Temple was she's, she was then and is always today a very social creature. So she wanted 
to do certain things and wanted it to be right. And that's not true, as you know, with some children. That's not the case. And I haven't got a solution to that when a child withdraws. But uh, what Temple keeps talking about manners, and I think they play in here. Uh, she learned very soon how to behave at the dinner table. And she's shocked today at the children who don't have those manners. And one of the ceremonies that we did as a family, when we had uh, parties, I would make the children get dressed in their good clothes and come downstairs and meet the guests and shake hands with the guests. Well, my son said how much he hated doing that as a child. Uh, but then, when he grew up, he found it worked. You see, what happened in the handshaking ceremony was he had to shake hands with Mr. So-and-so and learn to look him in the eye. And Mr. So-and-so, who was doing the same thing with his children, would absolutely play the role right out. It was like a little rehearsal for the future. And what my son said was, when it came time to get a job, he had no trouble talking to older men. And he noticed that the friends of his, who'd never had that kind of social exchange, actively talked to them. He had trouble getting jobs because they couldn't get by the first interview. I see that Temple today, I, I, I laugh because I think there were some other things she was learning, but it obviously meant a great deal to her as a child to learn to do this. And she wants to have other, other children. And she knows it can be done because she did it and wants to see other children on the spectrum exchange that way, understand that it's a social procedure. It's what we do as social creatures. Okay. Sorry. So tip four is is that I believe, um, and, and having worked with a lot of children, is is that in the heat of the moment when there are behaviors that are escalating, our best response is to stay calm. And that if we escalate, that it only continues to escalate the child's behavior. And I think overall that, you know, just looking at parenting and, and working with my two grandkids and, you know, the, the children of my life is that I have found that as people are calm, they seem to be much more effective with these children. And, and you know, saving that, that yelling, you know, if you yell, I think if you yell a lot, yelling becomes white noise to children. And, and saving that time when you yell something for those times when a child is in danger of being hit by a car or there's something else that is imminent danger. And I think, you know, part of that is, is that we have to know when we're starting to escalate and when we need to take a time out. Now, I'm going to say this is that, um, uh, that as a teacher, um, you know, I have made a lot of mistakes and, and um, you know, uh, God has a funny way of uh, playing jokes on you and and he gave me a grandson who had some behavioral difficulties for a while and, and, and challenged me. So one of the things that I want to say to the parents here is, is that we all make mistakes. Um, and I think as a teacher, I was lucky enough to work with colleagues and family members. Um, I see Susan Marino's on this list, who is a parent who taught me a lot. And, and the people in Indiana who continue to teach me a lot that sometimes we just need to take a time out if possible and back away because we know that as we escalate, we will continue to escalate that behavior as well. You Stacia. Uh, uh, yes, I just wanted to add to that the question of games and poor sportsmanship. This is a very tricky one for for those on the spectrum because they've been praised for everything that they've done in order to, and they've done a lot, and they've accomplished a lot. So the idea that they didn't win this game, somebody else won, they don't get. And when they complain about it, and the other children say, poor sport, they're totally 
totally can't figure it out, lost. This is a very hard step for them to understand and accept and work with. Again, I keep thinking of Temple's childhood, but what really in the end got her through that step was she, as she said herself later, like the other kids have rules about games. And I learned that if I didn't play by the rules, I wouldn't be included in the game. And again, she was a social creature. She wanted to be part of the game. That's not always an easy step. You, Stacia, you, you talked about uh, your escape time was acting. And I think it's really important when we talk about, Kathy just said, sometimes you need to take a time out. You had some regularly scheduled time outs for yourself where you went and did something yes, did. without your children. And yes, you talk a lot about that being important. Yes, it is. It's terribly important. And, and I was working in the theater and it had nothing to do with children. They knew I had children but they didn't know that I had a child on the spectrum. They didn't even know, they wouldn't have even known what autism was. So I could go and it was just my identity. I could, I could be myself and it was, it, it not only gave me a respite from, from what was going on at home, but it gave me an objectivity. And then of course, what I do feel for, Whatever you do as a parent, whatever is your activity, you bring it back into the home. And children like that. My children saw me act, and immediately they wanted to act. They, we had sheets across the bedroom, and we had costumes, and we had makeup, and we had leading characters, and not much plot in there. They were interested in plot. They were interested in... Yes? You say that's probably one of the reasons that Temple does such a great job of presenting, is that she had that background in in theater, in acting, as part of of, of her upbringing. I think you're right. And Mm -hmm. and I think their parents feel that they somehow they don't deserve this life on their own. And what they haven't lived long enough to know is that that will contribute to the picture. It will not take away from it. You'll bring something to them that they wouldn't have thought of on their own. So um, the rule of thumb is is that any time that you have a child who engages in verbal arguments, and we have uh, many individuals on the spectrum who want to get into nonstop verbal arguments. So the rule of thumb is, is that the more that you talk, expect an argument back. And so we encourage families to use um, uh, visuals, nonverbal means, hand gestures, other things. But the more that you argue with someone who is getting into verbal arguments, the more that you can expect something back. And if you go to the website for the Indiana Resource Center for Autism, we actually have a number of visual supports for free that you can use. And we also have a YouTube video called Autism House that shows how visuals can be used in the context of the home. But I think as much as possible, think about, you know, if your child keeps coming back to you with more verbal arguments, step back and think about how you can respond in a, in a nonverbal way. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And what, what you're saying brings to mind the words of another Kathy, Dr. Kathy Lord, who said to me the other day that that it's very important for children on the spectrum to learn things at the same time that the other children are learning. The other children also have to learn not to argue about questions. And Temple picked up on that because we, we're a sizable family. And uh, I had to laugh when my youngest daughter told me that when she was raising her boys, she heard herself saying the same words that I had said to them when she was growing up. The words were, this is what we're going to do. Now, do you want it nice or do you want it cross? I'm perfectly happy to do it either way. And it meant no negotiation. On the other hand, if I answered what they wanted to do by saying, we'll see, it meant, well, I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to decide. But if you nag at me, 
I'll get cross and probably say no. And so you better just cool it. Well, this is where laughter comes in. I, the, my other children, Temple's three siblings, figured out very fast that mom would laugh at jokes. So they learned how to joke. And it was a way of negotiating without getting angry, without getting worked up. And Temple liked it. And Kathy, you speak of, of Temple loving to perform because she learned it as a child. She's also quite funny. And she learned it from her siblings. And one of the times she learned it was like this, that you're much more likely to get to what you want by laughter. You catch more flies with molasses than with vinegar. And it worked. They got a lot of times, they got things that I wasn't so sure I would go along with. But I did go along with it because of their attitude. And Temple liked that. That was the fun of a negotiation. Interesting. So tip six is, uh, I know that this is counterintuitive, but the best time to really address behavior is when behavior is not happening. And proactive approaches are always going to be much more effective than reactive. When you are responding reactively to a behavior, you're in the moment, there's a crisis happening, and you have to react. And, and the, you know, the common belief and understanding is, is that for all of us, when we are the angriest, when we are the most upset, then um, the quality of our judgment is the lowest. So if a child is upset, they're tantruming, lecturing at them is not going to be as effective as working on calming them down, getting past the situation, and then, not in the next moment, but when you know that they've been calm for even a day or so, that you start looking at what is leading up to this behavior, what is the skill deficit, what are the antecedents, what's happening, and how do we give them different skills? Um, and instead of focusing on those reactive approaches, which, which if you're always in a reactive mode, then don't be surprised that your child will always be reactive. But again, I want to come back to, and I'm going to hit on this several times, is that there is very clear research that says that the most effective strategy for dealing with behaviors is to teach kids a different way of responding. And so you can only do that when the child is calm. So the other thing that I would suggest is when the child is just coming down, what, what I spend a lot of time in schools, and what I hate to see is a staff member going up behind the child as soon as they're calming down and saying, I told you I never want to see that behavior again. And in that moment, you have now given that child the invitation to re-escalate their behavior, and you've created a power struggle with them. The goal is not that you're going to win. The goal is not that you know you're going to um, that you're going to come out the winner. You're going to show the child who's control. The goal is that in that moment you're going to calm the behavior and then get to the point where you can teach the child a different response later on. Eustacia. Well, I, it it cuts both ways. I don't think any of us can learn something when we're upset. We have to wait till we're calm, and we have to wait for another time to talk. Uh, in this case, I'm thinking of neighbors when we moved to Bronxville, New York. And I knew that I'd need to give them some kind of preparation when Temple arrived. And again, these things work better than before angry episodes happen. Mm -hmm. So before Temple arrived, I went around to every house and I introduced myself. And I told them that there would be a little girl who would come to the door. They'd hear a knock on the door. They'd open it. And this little girl would say, I'm Temple Grandin. And I explained about Temple. And it, it prepared them. They, it was wonderful. The result was they really want to help, and they really did help. But you have to help neighbors, particularly new neighbors or new situation. They have to know how to help. And I think this is something we haven't really focused on 
enough. It's one of the things I did like about Dr. Melmed's new book that's coming out is he feels very strongly that we have to educate what he calls the extended family. That's those, that's neighbors, whoever's around needs to have some kind of clue on how to proceed before an episode happens. Have you got something now, Kathy? Have you got some thoughts? Chris, are you free enough to put in some thoughts? I think Chris said that she felt like she was going to be... Are you collecting questions too fast? Chris, do you want to pull... There we go. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, we have some questions, and I wanted to read those to you if you're interested in answering them. What do you think? Do you think we should? I don't, I don't know why not. Let's, um, if they're child-specific questions, what I would say is um, we probably, if we have time at the end, but if there's generic questions, I think that would be great. Uh, some of the generic ones are, are, you know, if you could elude when these strategies work in middle school and when they're good for older kids, that would be helpful. Um, and then somebody else wanted to know the video, the YouTube video. What was that called? It was and, called Autism, Autism House. Okay, so I'm just going to thank you, Autism House, and I will put that up there. So, and, and I okay. You, I have to tell you that I've worked with individuals from the earliest point of diagnosis till death. And um, these strategies work with all individuals, and they work with each of us. So good behavioral principles are good behavioral principles. So tip seven is understand that behavior may be an indicator of oftentimes that kids don't have a different way of communicating. We know that there's a very tight relationship between a lack of communication system. And even for our folks who are highly verbal, they still may not be able to tell us what they're really thinking and feeling. We know that they may be an indicator of health issues. You know, I've worked with children who um, uh, have uh, gastrointestinal issues and may become constipated for seven and eight days at a time. For some kids, it's that they're bored, they're confused, they have anxiety, which many of our folks have anxiety. If there's unexpected changes, and there could be a multitude of things. But when I think about behavior, I think about behavior Kind of, I do a medical analogy, and, and people who've heard me speak have heard me use this before. But when I look at behaviors, I think about, I, I've inherited an 87-year-old um, Greek, Greek mother. And several years ago, she became ill. She had um, headaches and a lot of other health issues going on. Would go to one doctor, and they would treat one symptom. Would go to another doctor, and they treat another symptom. And finally went to a doctor and said, we need to figure out what's causing all of these symptoms. And so found out that she had lymphoma that was all contained in her spleen. And once her spleen was removed, she went into remission and all the symptoms disappeared. So I think what happens is, is that when we look at behavior, oftentimes we treat the symptoms, the hitting, the kicking, the screaming, the refusal, whatever the behavior is, instead of treating the underlying conditions or the things that are creating the behavior. So again, you know, I, I'm going to hit on this point really hard is, is that for these children, you can tell them no, you can punish them, you can do whatever, but if a child does not have any better self-management tools, they have no better communication tools, they're going to continue to engage in that behavior until they're taught that alternative skill. Eustacia. Well, several thoughts occurred to me. Uh, I'm interested that you've touched on a really vital point, and that is that people look at the symptoms. They don't look at the cause. And you realize that that goes back to the original diagnosis of autism back in 1943 with Dr. Kana, Dr. Leo Kana, who was the first one who brought autism to everybody's attention. They were diagnosing it through the symptoms. They didn't look for the cause the source of the symptoms, which of course was not emotion, was not a, a, what did they call it? Psychosocial. It was not psychosocial, but bioneurological. And that's essentially what you're saying. That there's no point. You, you're aiming at the wrong target. Would be my answer to what you're saying. The, the point is not uh, that they are upset, but what's the source that's, that's upsetting them? 
that's not easy to figure out. If I drop my glasses, I can't read what it was I wanted to read here. Uh, oh, I know. I had a note here. Again, Chris, are you free enough to to talk? You had a, a lot of stories. I keep muting oh. myself. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Well, well, you have to to pick up the questions, but I'm thinking of what you you're dealing with children who've gotten into court, and the court doesn't always understand why this child is there. They only understand the behavior. Right, and, and, and they're very I, limited. The courts are very limited in what they can do to help a child. So, and they're they're usually quite honest about that. They say there's nothing we can do in the courts. Unfortunately, when there's nothing they can do in the courts, they just say good luck, and then the parents leave without getting any help. A lot of parents reach for the legal system to actually get help. I think the health issues thing, though, is something that um, I really like the fact that Kathy has that on there, and I think that is crucial because a lot of the little ones that I work with, and I know older kids too have problems, but there's allergies and um, there's uh, stomach issues and there's colds and there's not getting enough sleep and there's eating too much sugar. All these things, when you got a little tiny body, really have a huge impact. So I think it, you know, just looking at the behaviors without sitting there and saying, all the things that lead to us being cranky, which is hungry, tired, and not being able to breathe appropriately, that makes us cranky. And you have to acknowledge that children do that too. But as far as in the court system, I think that um, that's something we hope parents don't get there. I think parents go there often to get help. Like they'll, they'll call the police because their child's beating them up. And they'll then they'll get in the court system and there's nothing that can be done. So... It's a, an awkward place to be with a child with a disability, and you have to be have somebody there that really knows how to deal with that whole system as well as a child with a disability. I'm not sure that answered your question, Eustacia. But, well, um, it, it fills it in because I'm not in touch with that world that you're in touch with, with both you and Kathy. Are, I bring to it uh, a, a different perspective. And particularly right now, because I've been studying the social history of autism, I keep looking back, how did we get to where we are today? And you see vestiges of old, old solutions that really don't work, but they're still hanging around and we're still turning to them. Uh, I think, so Kathy, oh, I know. Here's Wait, Kathy yeah. can you go into that? I love what you're coming up here with, with uh, Eight, but number eight. Let's go ahead and move on to eight and nine. Let's do those two together, Chris. So I think um, I can't. <laughs> I know, but move on. Say to know, you know, I think that um, telling a child no when they don't have a different way of responding is um, not going to be very um, effective. And I, I have found that for these kids to distract, to refocus, and teach is really helpful. So let's go on to the next one, and then Tim, and you say, so then I'm going to ask you a specific question about Temple. I'll make a comment. I think that oftentimes what I hear is that people want to control these kids. And I've really struggled with this concept of control. And, um, um, and I think that I've always struggled with people when they say, well, this child is just doing this to control um, us. And you know, my response is that all of us should be good to control. Um, all of us will at times try to control situations, so it's we should expect that these kids do. I think the thing for our children with autism is that oftentimes they don't know how to control or who to trust with that control. And so if control is an issue, because, you know, just your station, like you said, if your children pushed you too hard on an answer, and I've got this too, you push me too hard, I'm going to push better. And so instead of providing choice, and, um, and at the same time, and this is kind of a different point, and so I'll ask you a couple different questions. What I see is that sometimes we over, overly accommodate children with autism. We accommodate their behaviors or we, we lock ourselves in rooms because they are too upset or we accept too much. And sometimes, and there's going to be a balance about how much we focus on getting rid of those behaviors and how much we accommodate those behaviors. And for every child, that balance is going to be different. But my plea to all of you is, is that we have a 70% unemployment rate for children, adults on the autism spectrum. And so we have to think about what are the things that we're doing now that are going to hinder them. 
And I see some individuals who are being accommodated by right out of life options. So let me just ask you, Stacia, I remember several years ago when you were in Indiana, or a few years ago, somebody in the audience asked you, how did you force Temple to do her homework? And your response to that was, I never forced Temple to do her homework. I coerced. Well, this is, this is, there are several steps in here. And, and one of the points, I, I like your point about provide choice. The question is, you have to, um, let's go into that first. First of all, the child has to understand what the choice is. And they don't always. And they have to see its advantage, its what, what choice will work the best for them. They all. Eustacia, we've lost your sound. What has happened? I cannot hear you. Um, Kathy, can you talk and let me see if I can hear you? Sure, let's just go on to the next tip. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. I'm not sure what happened to Eustacia. Okay, let's go ahead on to the next tip while she's figuring that out. I think tip, tip 10, and, and I noticed that on the questions, there were some questions about um, uh, strategies for school. And I think for these kids, you know, at the heart of many of our children with autism is this whole thing around anxiety. And I know that anxiety has been an issue for, for Temple. And um, so a lot of what we do is really about how to decrease that anxiety. And those include things like schedules that give some kids some predictability. They'll tell them what's going to happen. I think engagement is really critical. Um, and and um, one of the things um, being in around a lot of family members who have children is really striking to me is, is that um, as much as we can engage children, that helps to kind of teach them things, but also um, eliminates the possibility for them to engage in problematic behavior. We always talk about the need for predictability and routine, but I think the danger in that is that you also want to make sure that children can adjust to change. And so while you want to have some predictability and routine, you want to also make sure that you support them in adjusting to some of those changes. So, for example, when we build schedules in schools, and you can do this at home, you may on a Saturday morning have a schedule on the refrigerator but within that, have a change card that, so that it tells the family or tells the child that some days there's going to be things that change. Activities that motivate, you know, if you know what your child's interests are, you know, obviously Temple's interests have been about lifestyle and elevators. And so knowing what those activities are is a great way to build relationships, but also motivates them and serves as a system of reinforcement. We do a lot of what's called pre-met principle, which is if you pick up your, your room, then you can go out and play. If you do this, then you can have the iPad. And then again, we always love the use of visuals because we found that visuals are incredibly critical for these kids. And then sometimes, I have to tell you, just returning to the basics. The basics of parenting are really important. And so um, those are just some of the strategies that I see one. Okay. Well, Eustacia, are you there again? No, she's no. not there. So she's not. Um, she's going to go out and come back in. Um, we're going to move on. I will tell you that uh, Eustacia has some interesting stories to tell about things with Temple. Um, she had a, a party once where she was emphatic with Temple about not bringing the squeeze machine, and if those of you know Temple and know about her squeeze machine, down to the party. It was a Christmas party, and they were inviting a lot of people over. She said, not to bring that down to the living room. And Temple was very compliant and said, oh, she wouldn't do that. Um, what Eustacia didn't count on, Temple brought all the guests up to her bedroom through all the mess of the house because it was a Christmas party and they'd thrown everything upstairs and to get downstairs cleaned up. And so Temple uh, took all the guests up there and showed them her squeeze machine, much to the horror of Eustacia and all the brothers and sisters. So she said, and her thing is, you know, you can have a plan, but you never know if it's going to actually work out. So you kind of have to be ready for um, anything that might happen, not just a plan. 
So that was uh, the story she was going to tell you at that point. Kathy, we have a couple of questions that I'd kind of like you to go to if you don't mind. Um, I think they're pretty important. Um, one of them said, do you recommend visual schedules for early intervention? Um, I'm going to say yes, but you answer I, that. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, you know, that sometimes, you know, there's so many, there's so many uh, ideas and opinions about, about the effective programming for kids with uh, young children on the autism spectrum. And um, what I have found is that many children, and about 70% of us are, are visual learners, so I found many children who benefit from visual schedules. I know that some people will say that visual schedules are not an evidence-based practice. They are. Um, and if you have a question about evidence-based practices, I would encourage you to look at the website for the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders, which lists the 27 evidence-based practices. Um, but I have found visual schedules and visual supports to be helpful for many kids to help them really decrease their anxiety and help them to understand exactly what is going to happen. Okay, and then somebody else want to know if taking minutes away from a favorite activity is a good idea or a bad idea. And um, but what do you say on that? Because I always find that sometimes activities, are, like people will say, well, you're missing five minutes of recess. Well, they really need recess. So you don't want to take away, even though they enjoy recess, you don't want to take that away because it's something they really need. So it it is a hard call as far as i'm concerned a favorite activity that's really good for you is might not be the one that you want to cut back on but kathy what do you say but i think that again it goes back to having a really good understanding of the child and what really motivates them i agree with you for some children recess is a punishment it is not something that they really enjoy and so um you have to understand and for some kids too if you allow them some time to regroup um you know, we can't be rigid and say, okay, you've got five minutes to calm down. And then you say, okay, I've told you that there's five minutes and now you've got to go back to it. You have to know the signs of anxiety for your child and know if five minutes is enough. And then at the same time, know when children are trying to escape things. So again, I wish that there was, um, that there was a formula for this, but I think you have to know the child and what works for them. Yeah, I agree. It really, it is all about understanding what works for the child. So, all right, um, let's go on to tip 11 and see if our dear friend is back with us or not. I don't know what's happened. And she's and totally noticed, gone, so. And I noticed that several of the questions are about the National Professional Development Center on ASD. And I typed that in, but it's not letting me send it for so, um, um, But, you know, if you have questions about it, Email me. So the next one is is that uh, tip eleven is is that um, you know the attitude is, is if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always gotten. And um, I talk about you know when I'm working with folks, you know my school folks in Indiana have heard this before, is that when I'm working with people, I work with the and and the but people. And the but people are this will not work. I've tried this before, you know and. You know, they've got all the buts for why something doesn't happen. And my experience is, is that things oftentimes don't work because the child developmentally isn't at the place where it's going to work. And if you try it later, it will work. It hasn't been tried long enough and we give up too quickly because sometimes when we first start working on behavior change, you have to expect that the behavior is actually going to increase for a while. So you've got to hang in there. If you know that you've developed a program based on what you know about the child, and, and, and don't think that you can do this by yourself. None of us can do it by ourselves. I've always been surrounded by really great teams who help me out. And, and the other reason that it doesn't work is because it's not done with fidelity. And that means that it's not done according to the way that research tells us it needs to be done. For example, um, keep visual supports are an evidence-based practice. And people will say to me, but the visual supports aren't working. And then I go into the room and I see that the visual supports are in somebody's desk and they're not visual to me or to anybody else. So you have to make sure that it's done with fidelity. So I think the hardest question is when you're looking at behavior change. Again, you've got to look at what is it that I did? And I will tell you that I've worked with individuals with really challenging behaviors. And I know that there has been times that I have contributed to the behavior. I know um, I laugh about it because you know, my grandson had, for me, the dreaded um, 
the dreaded behavior of whining, which to me um, is a hard behavior. And, you know, we would go to the, the grocery store and he would whine and scream for candy. And I, being the good behavior, is, was determined that I was going to hold off and I wasn't going to let him have access to candy. And as he's throwing himself down on the floor, I look two aisles down and the dean of education is there. And then I start throwing candy into his mouth. So understand that we play a role in behavior. And so we have, and I knew I did, I, I was going to have to go back and, and fix that. And believe me, it's taken some time because he's definitely figured out how to push all my buttons. And so testing, um, testing, testing. Now so, it's working. You're on. You're on. Can you hear Sorry, us, Kathy? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm trying to enable the video. It says I don't okay. have privileges. I got you privileges. Okay. okay, everybody can hear you. Okay. So, um, you know, <laughs> as we do the dance, we really have to think about how we participate in that dance as well. At least it's until I know what I've done. So, Chris, do you want to just go on to the next tip and then use space? You can provide some of her insight before the last one. Sure. Uh, We're moving to the last one, are we? Yes, we are. We're on, and, okay. and this is one that sometimes changing behavior requires a willingness to change, working hard, and a calm perseverance. You know, Kathy, I'm going to say something on this one before you even start. I think one of the hardest things, and this is for teachers, and I'm a teacher, so I, you know, I, I certainly don't want to offend anybody, but I will say getting teachers to change a strategy that has worked for them with kids for years, and suddenly you're bringing up in a child and you're going, okay, this child, that's not going to work. You have to change what you're doing in order to help this child. And it's very hard. I mean, if you've been successful using a certain way or behavioral strategy and it works for you, to change is hard. Change is hard for everybody. So I just want to throw that out there. Uh, I think the other thing is, is that if a strategy that you've used has been effective with your neurotypical children, whatever that means, and uh, and it's really hard then to say I'm trying I'm using this on my child on the autism spectrum and it's not working. And you know we typically use the parenting skills that we learned from our parents, and they were effective with us hopefully, and effective with maybe some of our other children. But it's really hard. And I think the other part of this is that there's no quick fix. You know people who come in and tell you that there's a magic wand or a quick fix, there really isn't. Eustacia, do you have some comments? Yeah, uh, yeah it was since I'm coming in in the middle and I'm not picking up exactly on what you're saying, uh, so I will just add some thoughts of my own at this point. Uh, it is hard to change. Uh, not only, I think teachers do have a routine that's worked. Parents don't always have an insight to what they're doing. And... I think sometimes when you, you've done something and it didn't work, you, you, you have to, you can't beat up on yourself. You, you think, okay, that was the best I could do at that time. Now I would do differently. And I've even said that to my children when, when any of them, when they've been upset, it was the best they could, I could do then. And part of change involves accepting that in yourself. So, you Eustacia, do you, do you really think you've accepted that? Because we have a lot of conversations, and I think you still feel bad about some of the things that you said you yes, would have done do. differently. Yeah, I, I do. And that's why I think I tucked that thing in and then put in the, the, the other poem by Robert Burns about the, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glay and yes. leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. With... I don't think we ever get beyond that. You know, you had a you had another. Uh, there was a question here that I wanted to throw out to you, and then someone said they have a, an older child um, who doesn't. She, I can't find it now, but it's a child is saying, "How did you get Temple to to care about cleaning the house and doing the things that we assume people need to do before they can uh, be independent? Because they have no interest, or child has no interest in doing any of these things." So, do you have any any words of wisdom on that, or just good no, luck? No, and, and I think again, you you have to choose, you have to decide where to draw the line, because I would make the other children do chores, and I wouldn't include Temple for peace in the family. And the other children did 
kind of understand that. They knew that that if I had to, if it became a, a, a an argument about everybody is going to do this chore, it would only get worse. And somehow they knew that the problem, the problems for Temple were bigger than any words, any discipline. And it was easier. So you're always making this bargain with the family. And, and uh, that That's good. You, you do make a bargain with your family. And maybe teachers have to make a bargain in the classroom with the other students, too. Yeah, and this, this is like the times in school. And this went all the way through Temple's adolescence, where it, you just have to go home for the day. It's not going to work. Nobody's, and everybody has to wait till everybody's nervous system has quieted down. Uh, where does, where does, yes, a certain relaxation play into this? When your child is at ease, which really means essentially they're relaxed, they can, uh, they can think better, they can cooperate better and they can cooperate as best they can and kathy mentioned that in the previous slide when you were playing with your um and, and what i found <laughs> happened was as i adjusted my earphones so i could hear kathy better i hit the mute button ah that's well, what the problem was life is like that um, sorry yes <laughs> So, Sorry about but, that. <laughs> but Kathy was talking about schedules and things that reduce anxiety. And you're saying that, you know, it's like anxiety for the whole family is important to think of, too. So, yeah, the you know. whole picture. Okay, well, uh, let's, um, let's get back to Kathy on this. And Kathy, there were some questions. Do you want to answer those now or do you want to wrap this part up and then do some questions? Maybe let's just wrap this part up. And, and I think, you know, ultimately... Um, the goal is, you know, improved quality of life for all involved. And I think um, we talk about autism as being a whole body condition, that it influences kids' health, their communication, their social skills. But it's also a whole family condition. And it influences every family member. And um, and I think, you know, Eustacia, um, you know, talking about the acting and the things that she's done with her children. And Eustacia, I don't mean to speak for you, but I know that you're not only concerned about how Temple about Temple's quality of life, but you're concerned about every one in your family's quality of life and how everybody's behavior has influenced each other. And I know that balancing that out is hard. And as a parent who is sometimes overwhelmed by their child's own disability, I think one of the things that I would just add, and, and then you say, I'm going to hand it to you, is, you know, don't feel guilty. You know, I think that so often we make people feel guilty about what they can't do or what they're not doing or, you know, I want to believe in my heart that family members are doing the very best they can with the tools and support they have. And uh, guilt is really a non-productive means. And I know, having met so many families all over the country, all over the world, that there are parents all over this world who would walk across glass for their children on the autism spectrum. And so really this is about how do we improve your quality of life and how do we help your child with autism be part of that whole family unit, collective family <coughs> unit. Eustacia. Uh, I wish that it, your, your audio were coming through clearer to me. It keeps, uh, it's still not clear. And one of these days we'll get it ironed out. Uh, in all of the tangles we've been talking about, people have different ways of coming to terms with them. And for me, it's always been, if I understand why something happens, it's much easier for me to accept it. And it led me to the last paragraph, which I think is coming, gonna come up on the machine, up there from V.S. Ramachandran who has written brilliantly about autism, and I recommend the book. Uh, it's from a book called The Telltale Brain, and I suggest to everybody that it's worth reading, particularly the chapter on autism. Do you want me to read it? Uh, it's, it's long. Everybody can read it. It's up there on the machine. But it, it, the real point of it is the, that... Uh, 
The self actually emerges from a reciprocity of interacts with others and with the body it is embedded in. He talks about this double sense of ourselves, not just internally what we're feeling, but how we are affecting people. We're also always conscious of how we are in relation to other people. And he feels that this is where autism is it is at, at, is at a most difficult spot to work with. That, um, that our children don't have that double sense and therefore have got to learn a lot of it by rote and, and by rote for something that they have no way of really comprehending and taking into their, uh, their own view of life. Uh, it's true of any limitation, be it blindness or deafness. Uh, how do you explain the color red to somebody who is colorblind? They don't see what we see. And they don't usually don't uh, always realize. And we don't uh, uh, what it is we see. We don't know what they see. And some of that is there in this autism, in this back and forth exchange. Kathy, you use the phrase, autism is a dance. And I think you're right. We dance with each other, back and forth. Not always easy, but not impossible. Nicely, nicely said, Eustacia, I like that. Um, Kathy, do we have Three minutes and a couple of questions that I would like you. Have you been seeing the questions as they're coming up? I don't know if yeah, they're. You go, you go ahead and choose the questions you want to answer. Um, what about using sign language as a form of communication? Yeah, again, I know that this is you know sometimes controversial with folks, and um, I would say that early on for children who do not have language, we just need to think about um, uh, getting some kind of a communication system in place, and I'm. I'm a fan of kind of looking at all the options and whatever is going to work. Um, I have, there is absolutely, I know that old thinking used to be that if a child had a communication device or if they used sign language, that it would stop them from ever talking. That was, there's no research behind that. Um, and instead, for children who have difficulties talking, an AAC device or an iPad or, or sign language or some low tech device can actually facilitate conversation in the future. So I, I would be a supporter of using it all. Just get the words out because when children don't have a means to communicate, their frustration will turn into behavior. Okay, and then somebody mentioned refusal to work. And I think that um, a child simply saying no is probably the most difficult or just not doing what you ask them to do is the most difficult behavior to deal with and not doing rather than, you know, I'd rather have a child that acts out and throws something than a child that just sits there and doesn't do it. So um, any insight into that? Or uh, they said they use visual supports and options, including choice cards, but they still have refusal to work. Maybe some I, of that coercion that Eustacia talked about needs to come into play. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, you have to find out, um, again, you have to kind of go back to that functional behavioral assessment process to figure out why they're still are refusing. And um, and again, that's oftentimes it's gonna be, take some detective work to figure out why the child is doing it. Um, you know, you have to look at is, is the work motivating for the child? Is it too hard? Is it too difficult? You know, for some kids, if they're using, doing a lot of paper and pencil activity, they will refuse that because that work is typically difficult for them. But you have to find out exactly why the child is refusing. and. Um, and again, dig deep. And uh, you know, I don't know that there's a generic question. There's a lot of different tricks that you have to think about. Why is this child doing this? Right. Well, guys, we're pretty much out of time. We did get through all of them. I'm very impressed with that. Um, so, uh, Eustacia, would you like to wrap it up? And uh... oh, most of all, to thank you, Kathy, very much. You are. Uh, one of the top authorities and one of the most generous hearted. Everything that you have said and everything that you write points to that. And in the end, we are social creatures. We're incomplete without each other. 
And thank you for helping us to be complete.